And now I'm excited to um, uh, start our panel and introduce our panel. Um, unfortunately, the first introduction, first with an apology, um, Milia Vital unfortunately had a family illness um, and had to fly to Israel, but um, uh, you'll get to look at me instead of Milia Vital. We, we thank Milia Vital for being a huge supporter of this festival, um, and I'm sorry that she won't be um, here, that she's not here with us, um, but uh, I'm very excited to lead this panel and uh, to introduce uh, the panelists. So let me start by introducing, um, I'll tell you who's on it. Um, we have, um, and they could come up and join. We have director Iran Rickless is uh, sitting right here. <laughs> Holds the record of um, the, being the director of the most opening night films of this festival. Um, uh, <laughs> um, just the head of Shemi Zarchin. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying. Um, we're honored to have here, I mentioned, um, uh, writer, director of the TV, for here at the festival, the TV series Sleeping Bears, Karen Margalit. Please welcome Karen Margalit. Um, the actress who is in three films here at uh, the festival um, uh, this week, Netta Riskin. Netta is the star of Shelter, Saving Netta, and... And tonight's film, Longing, um, the hardest working actress in Israel, clearly. Um, and there's more, there's more. I was just sent another, another film that you were in that, uh, that I, you'll have to come back for that. A um, couple of weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll call you. Um, also, please welcome Ofer Naim. Ofer, Ofer's uh, been with us for many years. He's, uh, works for United King and is one of the leading producers in Israel. United King is the biggest film um, presenter in Israel and producer of films and um, uh, runs also a theater chain. Um, Ophir is here also producing, I think he produced two of the, our films here this year and many years, many films in the past. Um, I, I will note, um, so you don't yell at him, that Ophir is Shomer Shabbat and to respect that he's not going to be speaking with a microphone. Um, so. Um, Applaud the Shomer Shabbat, thank you. Um, and I'll take my seats and join you all. We're here to talk about um, the future of the Israeli film industry. I think that's, that's how we name this panel. Thank you, by the way, for putting me right in the middle. Um, I was planning on being on the side. Pressure, pressure. Yeah, yeah. The future of the Israeli um, film industry, and to do that, we also wanted to talk a little about the past and the present, um, and also about the future. There is, I'll start off just by saying, there is, of course, we've seen here with our Israel Film Center, um, the activity over the last 15 years of Israeli cinema that has turned from a budding industry into a blossoming industry. Um, with success around the world, and we'll talk about, also we, you'll hear I'm sure much about the success in Europe that is much larger than its success in the US, but there's definitely huge growth. Um, last year, there were over 10 Israeli films released theatrically here in New York. Um, Israeli film, feature films that were released, um, this was unprecedented and um, definitely leading to a whole new level of Israeli cinema. You see the quality, you see everything that's going on, you read articles about, um, about dozens of TV series that are being now made into American versions or things like Fauda that are taking the actual Israeli version and being uh, dubbed on Netflix. I actually never watched it on Netflix, but I hear there's a dubbed version, which uh, scares me a little bit, honestly. Um, and um, Israel, of course, has a very different industry. We want to not make this only... Um, for people who work in the industry, but really also for people who are fans of, um, of Israeli cinema to learn a little bit more about the trends, about um, um, some of the inspirations and what makes it work. How, how is all of this happening right now? Um, and I open this, by the way, a lot of the questions, all of you are welcome to comment if I'm asking Iran a question. Anyone uh, can join in because it's really, we see everybody here is people who are active in this industry and have an opinion that uh, they are welcome to share. Um, and we'll leave some time at the end also for your questions. Um, to talk about the background a little bit, um, one thing I'll note, first of all, is, uh, is, is historically, of course, is of the big change that really is noticeable internationally at least, in the last 15 years. Does anybody want to want to talk about what has made, what has changed in Israeli cinema to bring it to, 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 to make, what, what is the difference that's going on in Israel that brought it on? Iran looks ready. Um, I'm sorry, but I actually say I don't see a change, I see a continuation because we tend, all of us tend, especially Israelis, we tend to forget 
history a bit. And in fact, Israeli films back in the 60s were nominated for Academy Awards, were nominated and actually won uh, Golden Globes. So, you know, you ha it was, a, of course, a handful. It was a much smaller country, but uh, Israeli cinema in the 60s and 70s was, was huge. Domestically, first of all, which was uh, essentially the most impar important part. And most of the films were, of course, domestic comedies. But, you know, it's a bit like when you look at a lot of countries, you look at uh, France, the, the backbone of the industry is French comedies, big comedies that bring in, you know, 25, 30 million t tickets. Uh, so I think in Israel it was a little bit like that, but there were also films who broke out. So there is a sense of continuation. I think it's uh, what we did, a lot of us, in, in the kind of second and third and fourth generation of filmmakers, we did a kind of mini revolution, I think, in two uh, ways, two approaches. First, we remind ourselves all the time that films are made for an audience. So you have to, some, even if you want to make the most uh, somber, uh, slow, deep, dark film, you still have to realize that you, know, you want to bring people in, because if you have something to say, there should be an audience for it. Um, and two, I think we, we discovered, and it's something that I think a lot of filmmakers discovered around the world, is that the more local you are, the more universal you become. And you're not supposed to be ashamed, because there, there were many years when Israeli filmmakers, and, uh, and I think Israeli policy in a way, in terms of filmmaking, was okay, let's make the films in English, then it's going to work abroad, but that's all old news. And I think now, really, a, a good story is a good story, and that's where it stops. So that's kind of a beginning. I, w I will argue and say that in the last 15 years, if you look at film festivals, there, there was maybe a break there. There was a, definitely some times in the 60s and 70s and even in the early 80s with some strong, with some strong international presence. But the num first of all, the number of films and the quality of the films, both production quality, which with, uh, and 50% of Israel, and it might have sold a lot of tickets and every American Jew has seen Salah Shabbati, I hope. You've all seen Salah Shabbati. You're set. Um, but, uh, but the quality of Salah Shabbati cannot be compared to the quality today of Israeli cinema, which is on the highest of international levels. I disagree. <laughs> um, the sound quality? Can we, <laughs> can we agree on that? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'll tell you why I disagree, because I think Kishon, and there's a documentary tomorrow about him, right? I think Kishon was a genius. I, I was lucky enough to work. I did a, f a series back in the 90s, a TV series based on his writings. And the guy was a genius. Now, he had no idea about films. When he did Salah Shabbat, it was his first film. He had no idea how it works. He brought in, actually, an American uh, cameraman. And he did a brilliant job. You know, of course, I think we Israelis, and, and maybe everywhere, there's a lot of debates about this, this kind of approach to the whole Sephardi Ashkenazi kind of story. But, uh, but it was a start. And it drew, I think it drew in, more or less, 45% of the country, which is crazy. A small country, um, yes. <laughs> Back then, especially. Hundred people. Um, right. Um, but uh, the presence in every major international film festival now has uh, um, Israeli films um, more and more being produced. Oh, fair. How many films does uh, United King produce a year now? Uh, about uh, 12 films a year. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, because What's happened in Israel uh, put us uh, on the map of the, the movie. Because politically, Israel is uh, everywhere. And, uh, let's go with the cinema. Uh, everyone wants to see what's happened in Israel. So, so you're saying that politics actually dry is, is part of what drives um, the, which, which is interesting. And actually, I'm glad we're jumping into that because that's uh, that, that is a whole theme that I wanted to discuss here today. Um, what are the themes that drive Israeli cinema internationally? Um, anybody want to share? If if you feel that there are themes that uh, that drive, do you feel there's a direction? Oh, say you know, make a film about the Mossad. Make the film. Are there are there um, different themes that the filmmakers um, have to kind of um, have in mind in order to get greenlit and um, be a success? Or the things that people that you feel they're looking for in the Israeli I, film industry. I have an idea, but I'm not. It's not. Uh I, I didn't check it out, so it's just an idea so far. But I think 
I, I disagree a bit with Iran because uh, <laughs> I think today's film look much better than they used to. And uh, they, they don't look Israeli anymore. And they, back in the old days, you could, I could love Israeli movies, but they looked Israeli. It didn't look like a worldwide movie. It looked different. It sounded different. It looked bad. It was lit bad. It, was, it wasn't that good. I'm sorry. So, uh, I'm, you don't have to be sorry. I didn't yeah. make films in those yeah. days. Okay. But it was, yeah, no. that's what I know. It was the but 60s. It, it was yeah. the 70s. But, a um, I think, so first of all, Israelis learn how to, how to make films. And uh, I see it also in the younger generation. They are completely, technically, they are uh, the same level as anyone else and because the world became small because the in, the information the knowledge is accessible to everyone so i think that's part of it but also i think that israel had a, took it it took a long time for israelis uh creators to find the, the the right voice or the right scale of of an israeli story because you can't really do a uh, trip movie uh, i don't know how you call it Sirte Masa. i don't know road, road, road movies trips. or or uh a great ex escape movies or the scale is different so so you need to find the the right voice to tell a story and uh, it took some time and i think that uh the the last thing that that for me is always the most uh, interesting is when something is very specific i don't have to understand everything i don't have to understand everything about korean culture to, to enjoy a korean movie but the more it is specific and i'm not and i feel it that it's authentic and no one's lying to me and someone's telling me a truth that even if i don't fully understand it uh then i can relate to it and there the truth always comes through the the cracks of 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 culture so and i think for for and also the the world became much more open just as the I, I went to watch to see the band's visit a few days ago and I was shocked because there was a full house theater and the jokes were in Hebrew and it wasn't even an Israeli crowd so I could not imagine how would an American audience perceive this kind of show but they they became more open the world became more open to to absorb and to to get more stories about different cultures and about different environments than than they used to. I, I think this is a place where where you two are agreeing and I am agreeing as well um, that Israel finding its voice as far as being telling local stories and really finding um, its very specific culture. Mm -hmm. Um, is and, and I think packaging that in a international way. I always um, compare it to to hummus and how hummus used to be something that was very much that you only got in specialty stores. But then Israel figured out sabra. They figured out how to make the you know a, a flavor that is so very much specific for Israel, but packaging it internationally, putting it in the right chemicals to make it you know last in the refrigerator for long enough that you that your family can enjoy it for weeks. And uh, and I feel that this is kind of part of that cultural evolution. You know that's not hummus. You're aware of that, <laughs> right? Okay. M many grandmothers are upset about what's, uh, what Sabra's I'm doing. sorry, but th there is a certain truth that <laughs> has to be exposed. Um, Karen, I want to bring you into this. Um, it, Karen, you've worked on a lot of uh, TV. You started in, uh, I mean, your first project was a movie. Um, you work in, so I'd say you work in films, but also in TV. What part does TV play? And now we're living at a time where there's a revolution going on here in America right now, where, um, as you may see, all of, uh, a lot of the movie stars, a lot of the industry is moving towards television. What part does television play in the Israeli film industry? How do those relate? Uh, hi, hello. Uh, I'll tell you something. When I was in film school 25 years ago, I remember walking in the corridors with a secret that I didn't tell anyone that I really loved television. Because we sat there and we saw hours of Tarkovsky. And, um, and it was not like television was very low culture. You were not uh, very proud of it. And I knew I'm not a person of goodbyes. I hate saying goodbyes. For me, I go to the, to the cinema. After two hours, I have to say goodbye to someone I opened my heart to, not for me. And television was, you know, I, I lived with these characters for many years. And I loved the colors you can explore in, 
in TV series, because if you have a basket and you could put a, a film, you can put six colors. That's all the amount you have. And in a TV series, it's a matter of, of length. You can put a lot of colors and a lot of other characters. So um, I just want to put favor for TV here, because everyone said cinema, cinema. <laughs> And uh, in Israel, I think today what's happening all over the world, that television is like the great novels of the 19th and 20th centuries. You go a long way and very delicate uh, storylines, and it's about characters and uh, in a situation. And I think uh, Israeli television really works uh, around the world. You said, how do you... Uh, package something and sell it abroad, I think you never, if you have an agenda to do something, it's always doomed to fail. You, you, as much as you go inner to yourself, you throw errors far away, because the human nature, the human language about characters and human DNA is universal and it doesn't matter where you come from. But if we all talk about hate and envy and love, we know what we, what we talk about and it doesn't matter where we come from. So I think in tele uh, Israel nation is, if something general you can say, it's a nation of, of uh, startup, you know? Uh, uh, you don't have money, so you have to have a very, very good idea. If I have to have now a film about 40 people sitting in this room, that's all I have. I, I will find a good idea in the end. Who feels what, how we... We, we will uh, make it, and, and I think the, the lack of budget in Israel made uh, storytelling like startup very sharp and very um, well told. I said everything. Okay. That, that, that was beautiful. I had three, and I said so. And I'll throw into that that there's also a high level. And I'm still worried about the handful tickets uh, open for sleeping bears. And I said, handful is a lot or little? I didn't forget. So please close this line for me, uh, this corner, okay? Come tomorrow, 6.30, sleeping bears. You've done your job. Good. <laughs> What do you mean handful? Everything sold out and, and this handful is handful. small. Handful yeah, small. but still everything sold out and this is handful. No, <laughs> you come tomorrow. I'm a guest here. You won't embarrass me. I, I to tomorrow. That's, that's all we needed. That's why we're having this panel. Um, I will throw into also everything you said, the ingenuity of Israeli culture, both on the technological, on the hardworking level, on the, I mean, you could throw in the impacts of uh, the military there, but, um, uh, but also, but, but really, I think, with everything that's going up in, in the startup world of Israel, when I, I saw this movie yesterday, um, uh, we showed here, Almost Famous, which um, um, is a romantic comedy, and the use of, the, 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 it's about high school students, and they keep texting, and the use of that on screen was done um, so perfectly, and I'm sure for a eighth, if not less, of the price of what Hollywood would have paid, paid for that special effect. Um, and in general, Israel is often kind of getting involved with a lot of um, technology and cinema and doing it at a lower price in kind of a homegrown way in some ways. Um, Alfred, do you agree? Do you, is, that, is that how... Did you guys spend a lot of money on that effect? Uh, no. <laughs> because uh, we asked for uh, uh, an attack. A discount. A discount. Uh, but uh, you must uh, do a thing like this uh, uh, for the cow that uh, we got. You must sing like this so for the cow to come. I don't know what that's saying. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that if, if the cow. Oh, the crowd. Got it. Yes. For the crowd, sorry. See that uh, your movie is a uh, uh, high level, you will come. Israel has one of the unique things about the Israeli industry that's different than the American industry, and I want to get into those comparisons a little bit on a few levels, is um, in America there's a law that you can't be a producer of films, a exhibitor of films, and a distributor of films. You can't be all three. You could be two out of those three. Um, this was a law that uh, the, the, there was a big lawsuit against Paramount in the 70s, 60s, I'm going to say? 1948. 1948, wow, earlier than I remembered. Um, 
and this uh, changed the American film industry. A lot like that doesn't exist in most places in the world. And um, uh, United King is an example of um, people of a group that um, produces. Um, distributes and exhibits. You have uh, a chain, uh, the Cinema City chain, which is now an international chain and um, uh, beautiful theaters. And um, uh, of course, major producers. And, and this allows um, a lot of control over the industry. Um, where, where in Israel, you must do everything. <laughs> uh, nobody do for you a thing. And uh, uh, you must build a complex uh, to show uh, the film, um, and uh, that's why uh, our company decided to produce and to distribute what we produce. How many cinema cities do you have now? <laughs> we have uh, uh, in Gilead, in Mission, Jerusalem, uh, Natania, it's a four, and uh, until the end of the year, we will be two, uh, another two in Be'er Sheva and Hadera. Six uh, big complex uh, with... Uh, so I, I, take it, I take it by this, that Israelis are not going to the cinema any less. They're going more. Is that... Uh, would you say that's a trend? I think so. Like, uh, like everywhere, I think. So so the whole debate about television versus... Uh, Cinema, I don't think it's really a debate because I think they both exist in their own worlds and they interact because finally film people make television, television people make films. It's all one big world, world which is basically catering for the needs of the audiences. And the audiences vary, you know. I mean, for me, it's still shocking to see people who see if, uh, you know, a whole series on an iPad, but it's a reality. And I'm still, and I'm not, you know, I'm totally not old school, but there's still something that cannot beat a big cinema and a big screen and, you know, a proper sound coming at you and, uh, and the fact that you're actually trapped, in a good sense, uh, in a cinema, it, it makes you really, you know, be totally absorbed. That's one approach. Of course, then you have all this binge watching and all that, which is, uh, of course, totally part of what's going on today. Uh, but I think it means that, obviously, as a creator, you're not really sure um, you're never sure, actually, how much your audience is really with you. But I think at the end of the day, you know, when you put, put aside technology, put aside TV, put aside cinema, it all goes down to a good story. And I think Israelis who come from a Jewish tradition of, of storytellers, uh, just really, it took, our, it took time because, you know, it's a very young country and we had other issues uh, and we still have other issue, issues, but I think we found our voice, as Karen was saying, and, uh, or the Neta was saying, and uh, once we found this voice, we're still experimenting. You know, it's still touch and go. It's still what works, what doesn't work. What, uh, you know, are we trying to please our audiences or is the word please not the right word? Uh, how far do we go? I, I'm, a, I'm a really strong believer in the fact that cinema, and I say cinema in general for all the medias, all the mediums, um, is universal from the start, you know, but it's, it's like a good book. It's like anything else. It's, uh, there's no question, I think. I can tell you very quickly that 15 years ago, uh, when I got a call from a German producer who wanted to meet me, and I sort of said, okay, I'll meet you, and what do you want? I want co-productions. And I said, what is a co-production? I had no idea. And I sort of said, yeah, you know, I'm working on this script about this Druze bride on the border between Israel and Syria. I think nobody will be interested. And she said, well, sounds actually quite interesting. And three months later, I had a script. And a year later, I shot the film. And I had no, I had guilt feelings, because, you know, I'm Jewish, um, about, you know, maybe I should add a German character. Maybe I should add a German kind of storyline. But no, I was told by the Germans and the French, who are really the leaders in Europe in terms of collaboration with Israel, that you protect your story, first of all. And then you think about things like, okay, and again, as was said here before, you know, there are things that audiences don't understand, but I don't see an issue with that. Same way we see Chinese films or whatever. Plus, I have to say, I have to say one more thing because I'm always disturbed. By, I'm still going back to history. You know, there's a whole, this is part, sorry, this is part of, um, it's not only about Israel. You know, when French cinema started in the late 50s, the new wave of French cinema, that's part of the same revolution. That's part of, you know, suddenly, even in New York, even in, well, maybe not Kansas, but, you know, even in America, they suddenly heard about, somebody from Kansas? Sorry. Um, 
they suddenly heard about Truffaut or Godard or, you know, and then things changed globally. And I think Israel is part of that now. There's a lot, a lot of interesting things to talk about there. I, I, I want to comment, first of all, the theatrical experience. Um, I was thinking the other night we had here filming a, f a screening of this film, Scaffolding. Was anybody here for that? Um, it's going to have a release um, this fall, theatrically, hopefully. And it's a very small film. Um, it's, it was made with uh, mostly non-actors and kind of just tells a very intimate couldn't be more local story, done in the most beautiful way, in a very um, uh, intimate way too. Um, and you know, this is, is a small budget film, and I can't imagine seeing that film outside of the cinema. I feel like this film would lose so much by being shown, by being watched alone on an iPad, on a big screen TV, whatever it would be. Um, just this experience, there's so, much, so many beautiful silences in that movie that I think with distractions around us, without being completely in the dark, we would lose that. Um, and, and I see that a lot with the, with the it's a, just a great example of that, that local Israeli cinema that can speak to anyone, anywhere, if given the right opportunities. Um, but getting back, um, Iran, you also mentioned co-productions, which is a huge part of anybody who watches Israeli films sees all these different um, uh, funders at the beginning of the film, and it sometimes it's gotten almost comical at this point where you see 10 minutes of different um, uh, funding groups, often different countries. And what, first, just explain to the, to the um, audience, what is a co-production? What does that mean? And why don't we have co-productions with America? Why don't we? Yes. Well, I, I know the answer, but... Uh. Yes. I don't. But, uh, well, because America was never built for collaborating with the world. You know, that's the way it is. Um, we are not going to mention his name here today. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's on a plane now, isn't he? To, uh, uh, well, I think co-production is something that evolved in Europe. You know, there were the horrible years of what was called European, European puddings which were really, you would have films that were made, you know, from Hungarian money and Spanish money and Italian money and this and that. And everybody, every country had its, had its uh, demands and the, the films, the results were really terrible. Uh, but I think at some point people, like we, like we all said, at some point we all got a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more exposed to trends worldwide in cinema and in television. And we understood, like I said before, a good story is a good story. Well, Everybody's looking for a good story. And this story is set, uh, you know, in Israel. It's set in Israel. If, if it works, it works. And then um, I think we're still limited to, I would say, this axis of uh, France and Germany. Belgium is now becoming a player. The essence of it is, on one hand, every country protects its interests. We come from a certain vantage point in the sense that, you know, if the writer and director and producer are Israeli and at least one of the actors, if not more, then, you know, it's an Israeli film, first of all. And then that is joined in, but quite often, you know, Shelter that was shown here earlier this week, the majority of the finance was European, not Israeli. And still it's an Israeli film, even though most of it is in English, but it's in English not in a contrived way, it's a, a, as a necessity, in the, you know, for the dialogue in the film. So, but even that is a big debate, because the whole question of language is such a huge, issue now that, um, you know, it's hard to say where we're going in that sense. Apropos what you were saying, Fauda is screened in Hebrew, but there is a dubbed version running also on Netflix, and it's still, you know, it's still an issue. In Europe, it's certainly an issue, but they still watch dubbed films, which is horror for people like me, let's say. I, I would love to see Netflix's numbers on who watches it dubbed and who watches it, and, yeah. and then, you know, yeah. yell at all the people who watched it dubbed. Yeah. Um, but um, just to answer also my question, I asked that um, uh, as far as um, the Amer America not having um, co-productions, um, uh, as far as our industry being an independent industry and a studio industry, which is a business that's not government related, every other country has government funding for for films. Um, America, really, apart from uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, which is extremely limited, doesn't really have a place to co-produce with another country. Um, what does that? What it does bring? in, and this is um, a, a, an important point to bring on here, is that um, Americans do um, unofficially support Israeli cinema um, on an independent level, and um, we'll often see here films that are screened here that have an executive producer that is an American supporter who either loves film, loves Israel, loves both, 
um, is loves the, the topic within the film and is trying to find a way to support. And this is something that I very much encourage seeing as an alternative and an addition to the Israeli funds that um, exist, and we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a couple of minutes. But the um, but there there's an opportunity here for independents just the, um, to become investors or actually donors. To, is, to support Israeli cinema um, by Americans. And uh, we're looking here as part of our Israel Film Center to do this in, in some sort of more organized way um, to allow, allow people to actually apply for grants, funding, um, support from, um, is, from, for Israeli cinema from American donors, funders, and investors. Um, and that's something that we hope will grow, help spread the word, and uh, that's, that's what I'm throwing back to the audience. Can I, can I just add something Please. very quickly on that? I think the most, probably the number one issue in Israel that's bothering many of us is the fact that the government has to find a way to A, provide a tax shelter, which is what Europe is doing all over the place, and that's why people go to Belgium and other countries to shoot. And, uh, and B, we have an issue with uh, insurance. And I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of mundane stuff, but it's extremely important. You know, international producers are worried about shooting in Israel because everything is so fragile and you need some kind of backup from the government. So I think it's like it's, you know, it's almost under the door now that we need this kind of support. I think it will make a major change and will allow, let's say, Americans to really invest in, in, and really invest, not donate, invest in, in Israeli films. Um, yeah, I mean, it happens that productions happen in Israel, that American productions, but the insurance does make it uh, quite difficult and is an obstacle, but it's doable, and if one person did it, others can do it. Um, I'd like to ask a question here, really to both of you, um, and anyone can chime in. Um, Netta, I know you've recently, I, I was just given this film, uh, Damascus, what is it called? Uh, Damascus Cover. Damascus Cover. It's coming out actually in like a month from now. I, I haven't seen it yet, but um, it's an American production. I would love to hear, and Karen, I don't know how closely you've worked with the American and international versions of your shows, but I would love, to, and, and I know one of your movies right now is being made into an American version. I don't know if that's, that is really, that's happening. I'm excited. Um, uh, all I've got. Um, and um, is somebody else here a fan of that movie apart from me? I've shown it. Yes, see, it's all true. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit of the comparison of work, uh, the differences, that you, or, or the glaring differences, or a glaring difference between working with an American production and an Israeli production. You really <laughs> yeah. want to know? Yeah, please, and be honest, yes. Uh, it's just, it's a different world. It's a different standards. It's different. It's, I, I can't say many good things about going back to work in Israeli productions after being on an American set, just because uh, I was actually, we used to joke about it when I, we were working in Germany, when we were shooting a uh, shelter in Germany, that there were no screamings on set <laughs> um, because everything was just so polite and um, quiet and uh, as opposed to Israeli sets, which is just, it's like conducting a war, basically. <laughs> okay, so... Um, and I'm used to it, you know, I'm, I'm Israeli, that's the way I grew up in, uh, it's, it's always shoutings and it's chaos and it's, uh, you know, it's every day is like a miracle that this day happened and, um, <laughs> and, then, and then you go into an international, any, it doesn't, it's not necessarily an, an American production, anything that's not being shot in, in Israel, it's like, yeah, why, why shouldn't it happen? I mean, why why should it happen as as if it's about as it's not it shouldn't be a daily crisis. That's what I, that's what I mean. So um, for me, it is it is the difference is is uh, is endless because uh, I, we don't we 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 didn't shoot as many scenes as we should in in you know what that the the mo uh, I'll, Best example is I shot a I shot a movie in Germany, and at one point the actors felt that they need to go and rest and to rethink the scene they've done, 
And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Eastern European gymnastics. I mean, uh, I can do 25 scenes a day in the cold, in the snow, in the heat. Uh, <laughs> and they just needed to rest in their trailers. We don't have trailers. We sit on the floor, okay? <laughs> There's no word in Hebrew for trailer. No, I'm just kidding. There isn't, there is. by the way. We have, you know, you know that, the, now seriously, the last thing I've shot, I'm really, I'm, I'm bad-mouthing about Israeli production. That's but what last, we're really here for. But la last thing I shot, uh, we ran, okay, it's the kilometers. We had to run, it was an action scene. We had to run five kilometers that day, which is quite a lot, you know, if you're not, like, that's not what you do for a living. And to do it at seven o'clock in the morning. And we were three actors shooting in a, in a hospital tunnel, running five kilometers, which is like two and a half miles or something, and whatever. And, uh, and then when we, f we were done shooting, we asked, can, can we sit somewhere and rest? So some of the production uh, crew brought out a stretcher, one, just one stretcher. And he said, you know, like, uh, take, turns. take turns on it, okay? And well, Why was there so, a stretcher there? That's an uh, it was a hospital. We shot in a hospital. There's no, uh, forget, there's no trailer, but there are no chairs also. So we, we made turns on the stretcher, and we, when I was on the stretcher, so the other actor was, like, on the ground, and we did whatever. So that, that's, like, Israeli um, production. <laughs> Uh, at name condi conditions, yeah, but that's um, it's all about money, you know. At the end of the day. Although, although what you're saying is not about uh, money, because there's also a question of attitude. It sounds like. Well, well, that's an Israeli attitude in everything. It's nothing to do with the uh, cinema. It's just <laughs> that's the way this country goes. Karen, can you add to this? <laughs> Uh, I think basically in the end, it's all about the budget. We're talking about potential audience of 8 million people, including embryos. It's really, <laughs> you can't bring it back. It's really hard. So you need to think, okay, I need to find my way through international audience. It's hard to make films or television. And um, yes, it's different. I remember a show I did called Yellow Peppers that were, was made a version in the BBC called The A Word. And it was, I think, uh, one episode of the BBC A Word was like uh, the budget of almost a whole season of ours. It, the proportion were, was really, really crazy. Um, and yes, we, we work like this. It's really, really hard, but on the other hand, there is something very... Uh, I like to go to set because you become 17 again, and you and you, you, you get to be really creative. Like, you, if you, you're working with the actors who fit to you, it doesn't mean they're the best, but uh, me, I like a lot of time to... You come, you see the scene, you say, okay, basically what needs to happen is this, and you rewrite on set, and if the actress has this ability to learn very fast, it's an ability, it doesn't mean talent or not, so you can really be creative, and I, I think when I went back to, uh, after seeing uh, productions abroad, I missed that, and I was happy to come back to that, even though I hate the shouting, and really, it's uh, I f also, you say after, uh, you make a project, a film, or a series, you, it's like having a child. And I say, it's true, you're left with eight kilos <laughs> after a production, because you eat so bad, and you really, you don't breathe all day, but there's also some magic about it, I think, that, uh, that I missed, and I was glad to come back to. I want to touch on one more topic, and that's maybe the elephant in the room, um, uh, before I open it to questions from the audience. Um, um, but uh, the cultural minister, uh, Miri Regev, we get to... Uh, anybody here not know who Miri Regev is? Because she's actually made... The, she, the ex. She's made, she's made some uh, international press as far as her impact on Israeli cinema, and we hear that uh, she is often pushing for restrictions on the kinds of film, the themes of films that are being made, the topics of films that are being made. Um, I believe now the, actually, the production funds are are, she's pushing to change them to it be more government controlled and um, not through all the various funds that exist right now and to actually revolutionize the whole um, uh, um, 
f industry as far as the funding for films. How is this impacting Israeli cinema and beyond and TV? Um, is it impacting? Is uh, you know? Do you feel that you have the artistic freedom that uh, um, that you want? Um, is this something that's affecting filmmakers? It's interesting to ask also Ofer as a distributor and a producer if you f if you feel there's something there that you would like. I, I will say, and I'll bring that on here, I will say if you look at our, our, our festival this year, if you look at the films, um, uh, apart from Iran's film, really, most of them are pretty apolitical, which I'm not saying that's but a bad thing. But it's also uh, films you picked, maybe you're influenced by um, Miri Regev. It, it, it could be. I, yeah. <laughs> I tend to be easily influenced, but we try to take every year the mainstream kind of crop of the most popular films coming out of Israel. Um, and and uh, we do have another film festival here, I will say, the Other Israel Film Festival, which shows the films that are often more political um, and gets into that. Um, but I could say that even in that selection process, um, it's definitely not the, the strongest years we have felt. Um, and, and I ask this to all of you, is there, do you feel that you have full artistic freedom and will get the funding from the government um, for your projects or for any project that you would want to work on? Or do you feel limited? You know, what, what, you, what the films you have here are not a result of Miri Regev's uh, attempt to change the policies. These are films that were made just as she came into office. She's trying. I personally, I, I seriously say this, I personally believe her days are numbered in, in, in office. I think she made some really serious mistakes and I think she's, she's touching a limit which at some point is gonna burst really seriously because you know, Isra we're Israeli at the end of the day and Israelis are very single-minded on some things and nobody's gonna touch, nobody is gonna touch Israeli cinema. And there's no way that there's gonna be a, you know, a government fund that will have readers who are gonna say, you know, you can only do these kind of films. That never happened in the history of Israel. The funds are totally independent. You know, there's always influences. You never know, when you get a negative response, you never know why you got it. Maybe somebody sat there and sort of said, you know what, let's, cool, let's get this guy, this guy to cool off a bit. But that you never know and you can't prove it. And, and, and it's not, I'm never paranoid about that because I really feel that a good script gets made. I think the I don't think there are many scripts out there that did not get made or many good directors didn't have a chance to make their film because the funds were kind of, you know, trying to block something. That's my personal belief. Maybe I'm a bit naive, but I don't think I am. And I think Miri Regev is, um, you know, she, she, she's seriously a problem because it's, it comes from a mentality of control and control doesn't work with cinema. You know, it, it it's just simply doesn't work. So um, I think if, if there'll be a point where we have to really get up and fight seriously, there's all, you know, the problem is that all the time is kind of these exotic fights. You know, she, she walks out in the middle of an Academy Award ceremony, she comes back, next year she's barred from coming to the, to the ceremony, stuff like that, but that's all very local. I think on, a, on, a bigger, um, on the bigger screen, uh, we have a problem coming, but hopefully not. Maybe Messi saved us. Messi being this Argentinian soccer player who Miri Regev was involved with now and all that. But it's not for America, this story. You could find it online. Anyone, Neto, would you like to add? Uh, Karen? No, I don't really Anything understand you want to what say she about wants <laughs> because um, the, the whole thing of, uh, of uh, di dividing differently the, the, the money and, uh, and putting more, I, th I think it is more... Uh, more uh, um, Giving the the periphery more chances to to um, uh, how do you say? I forgot the word uh, for for the for the minorities to get yeah, other the movies. The, if you watch the movies that are being done in Israel, then there are hardly any movies about the old Ashkenazi establishment. I mean, most of the movies today are are scaffolding or. Um, I don't know, or Peratzil, or I don't know. It's just I don't. I really don't understand what she wants, and I don't think anyone does. She likes shouting, so <laughs> that's fine. It's nothing to do with filmmaking. Yeah, I think she's a uh, political. She bring money to the government. Yeah, but she was a point. You know, she's she's a public servant. That's all. 
She was appointed to be a minister. All she has to do is transfer the money. That's all. It's not her money. Still, you have uh, 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 X money, and today Less. you have more. No. I don't think so. Karen, you were going to say? I think she's a, truly a politician, and that, that's all that motivates her to give her surroundings benefits that uh, she will be re-elected in the party again. And uh, part of it is really dividing um, groups in Israel, and I think it's a um, shame and very sad. Um, I would love to... So if, maybe you have everything answered, and uh, you know everything you need to know about the Israeli film industry, but I would love to take questions, comments, thoughts, um, uh, uh, more about Mary Regev. Just kidding, actually, that's, that only adds no. to it. Yeah. Um, but we'll pass the mic around. Thank you. Um, I made uh, some films in Cinecita in Italy, and we got constant annoyances from the locals because we didn't have permissions or they wanted to extract money from us for permitting us to film. I was wondering, uh, in terms of the Israeli film industry, do you get a lot of interference from locals because you need permissions for everything? Here you need permissions for everything or you cannot shoot a thing. I think... Uh... <laughs> But I think it's like everywhere in the world. It depends on the local municipality at the end of the day. If, there's a, if the mayor has a film office and supports the industry, then you get everything you want. Sometimes you get to cities where the support is, uh, is not that uh, huge, or you have complex cities. I mean, take Jerusalem, for instance. Jerusalem has its, has its own fund, which is hugely successful. Uh, I was actually the first one who made a film under their, you know, the human resources manager was the first film they made. And it was a very good example of actually getting, you know, local support to do almost everything you want. On the other hand, you know, Jerusalem is a very sensitive and complicated city and, uh, and you have to be careful whatever you do. So the, I think it's, uh, I think despite, you know, the complaints about the Israeli industry and stretchers and stuff like that, it is a very um, professional industry. And we have, uh, and again, it's not about the new generation. We have uh, a long tradition of very good people who are hard workers. I mean, in that sense, it's closer to America than it is to Europe because people work long hours in tough conditions. Um, and, you know, also tough conditions physically because you know, it's a hot country, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in that sense, in the heyday of, of American films coming to Israel, all the Rambo 3s and all those kind of films, Delta Forces, whatever, uh, I think uh, international productions encountered a very efficient and professional local uh, industry, which goes with everything, permits and everything. Some hands here. I have a question. Are there actors' unions in Israel who can enforce you getting a chair at least? <laughs> <laughs> actors' unions. Yeah, of course. I was also... I was. No, I wasn't exaggerating. No, I was a bit exaggerating. We use, we have chairs, but uh, but that's it. You, you should enforce that because that's the problem. The old the go go boys, they broke half the unions no, in the U.S. We have we have chairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but don't and now you have a union, no? Yeah, of course, I, we have yeah. a union. Yeah, but the, but <laughs> not the, you know there's. I want to talk about the industry. Ma'am, ma'am, first of all, you need to talk into the microphone, not just hold it up. Okay. And I'm into the mic. going to talk about the industry of Israeli movies, okay? Uh, first of all, I was in the television here in the United States. Second, I prefer a story much better than to special effect and coloring and those things. I agree with you. It became much, much better, the lately, the Israeli movies. But... I think the Israeli movies lose the sense of humor because in the Salah Shabbati, it was fun because it was twisted humor, okay? Or there was an old movie like Casablanca. It was fun, but mostly the musicals. But lately, they go for very modern, like neorealistic. When I'm watching an Israeli movie, it almost looks like to me like I'm watching an Italian movie. When 
it's neorealistic, showing a lot of dark spots. It's not only dark spot in the life, okay? I would like to see some humor. That's <laughs> I would like to take this one and say that I feel that within the Israeli industry, there's something for everyone. And there's there's plenty of comedies, there's plenty of dark films, there's plenty of European style, American style, and everything now. There's such a diversity. Everything's being made. There's a question sometimes of what gets distributed internationally, and I'd say um, the comedies are a harder sell internationally. Um, I, I make to you a pledge and a promise here that we will try to bring more comedies to this festival if they're any good. <laughs> Uh, a question about how BDS affects uh, Israeli films and their distribution in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. If you ask me personally, I've, I've, I've encountered BDS, but normally it was, uh, if I encountered it really at the entrance to a cinema, my normal reaction would be, come in, watch the film, we'll talk later. And normally, later, it was easy to talk. It depends on who it is. You know, BDS, I think, is, is divided into many, many approaches. Some are aggressive and kind of really try to stop things. I think cinema is not suffering from it yet. I've never heard of a film being stopped by the BDS. Um, yeah, Karen, have you it's been... It's not a big factor in, in, our, in our life. Have you been impacted by BDS at all? No. No, I was thinking... No, no, I... You know, I'll tell you something. A few years ago, I was in a festival, and I was traveling two hours from the airport to the festival with Ken Loach, who's, you know, British, well-known British director. He's not BDS, but he's one of the strong... Uh, he's a strong opposition to Israeli arts, and he, he kind of, you know, he's pushing for boycotts and stuff like that. And we had two hours together, and I said to him, you know, how can you boycott somebody like me? You know, I try to make films all sorts of films, but I try to tell a certain truth about the country. Sometimes it's not pleasant, you know, what can you do? Uh, sometimes it's wonderful, and so normally it's a combination of, you know, beautiful things and, and, and bad things. And uh, you cannot stop these voices, it doesn't make sense. So I think the BDS, if, if I was in the BDS, I would, I would be a little bit smarter. So what did choosing he say? My targets. What did he answer you? Well, he's, he's British, you know, he was yeah. very polite, but... Um, you know, I think there's also, you know, th th there's really a difference between what reaches the media and what is done face to face. So of course, when you sit with somebody like him and you talk about it, he sees your reason, your reasoning, and I can see his reasoning. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, we're on a very, it's a, it's a, it's a tightrope in a way, and we have to balance ourselves. We filmmakers, we have to balance ourselves without compromising. We have to do things that will work without hiding certain truths, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. I think our, I really think that our life, I'm saying broadly speaking, our life as, as creators, as artists, as, uh, and it's not only filmmakers, is a tough one because um, we come from a country that we love and we are part of, and you know, some of us, a lot of us, uh, I'm gonna say this a little bit dramatically, but uh, you know, a lot of us spill blood for this country and that's not something you can kind of, you know, kind of shake away. And it, but it also gives us the right to observe and look deeply into what, what is problematic in Israeli society and try and do something to maybe open the eyes of certain people locally and worldwide just to look a little bit deeper beyond the headlines and beyond the kind of information we're fed all the time. And I think that's our role. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're doing a comedy for kids or you're doing a serious film about, you know, life and death in the Holy Land. It, um so, so let me actually ask the reverse question. Yes, there's the BDS side of it, but there's also the heavy criticism that uh, possibly comes from the Jewish community of the Israeli film industry being too left-wing. We, we see that uh, constantly coming up. Have you um, encountered that kind of pressure from from the more right, more Jewish um, side of things. We've all heard of the controversies around Foxtrot. There, there's, been, uh, there's been plenty of it over the years. Yeah, I think it's all fun at the end of the day. No, seriously, people have opinions. I think everybody has an opinion and it's totally legitimate. You know, it's, uh, and this whole thing about right wing and left wing, is, for me it's always absurd, you know, because it's okay, you're right wing, you have a good story, go and make it. 
It's uh, what's what's the question, you know, in terms of the actual the actual filmmakers? Filmmakers are filmmakers, and then there are there are political animals like everybody. Everybody has an opinion, and everybody brings his opinion to the screen. Without hopefully, I mean, personally, my approach is not to preach. Because when you become a preacher, it's a problem. But uh, I don't think there are many films who preach to their audiences. Neto, is there a film that you wouldn't take because of a political reason? <coughs> a role. Yeah, I guess there, there would be, but I was never offered one. <laughs> Not yet. Um, but as I mean, again, I mean, when when you say uh, when you ask this question, then would I be would I take part in a propaganda film? I guess I won't. But this. I re, re, I really don't get this kind of offers. I mean, this kind of movies are not really made. Luckily, they're not made in Israel. So, uh, not 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 a left wing propaganda film, not a right wing propaganda film. Just stories. So, I don't see myself. Uh, look, I've done. Uh, but again, I've I've done a role in in ultra orthodox TV show called Shtisel, Okay, am I uh, preaching to be uh, ultra orthodox religious? No, and it's not a propaganda show. It's about it's a story about people, and then everything could be interesting or not interesting. So on. We have time for one last question over here. Oh no, the microphone up there. That's our last question. You got it. Make it good. Uh, I don't know if that's a good question, but I'd like to ask about the level of acting in Israel and the culture of acting, if I compare it to England or America. And if I, I compare, for example, Khatufim uh, as opposed to Homeland, uh, in which I saw brilliant acting. And I had difficulty watching Khatufim because of the level of acting. Uh, is there an attempt to, let's say, raise the level of acting in Israel? I think Israeli actors, uh, there are brilliant actors. And in the end of the day, it's 50% uh, uh, the, the responsibility of the director. So uh, it's, uh, I, I don't think the, we need to l um, level up the actors. They're really, really great actors. And it's, in the end, it's about also text and directing and... And, yeah, so. Yeah, we made the woman woman. We made Wonder Woman. Um, I, I will add, it's a good thing Emilia Vital is not here because she's an actress in Khatufim, as you might know, and I hope she doesn't watch this. Oh, wow. But um, right. uh, I, 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 would, I would second and say that, that I mean, the Israeli acting, that's actually where, where the, there's a lot of raw quality that you know, the directors can either do a terrible job with or a great job with. And, um, yep. and I think there's plenty that do a great job with them. Folks, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this thank panel. You for being so honest. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us for this event and also the events that are not free this week. Um, we look forward to seeing you at many others. And um, Longing will be in this room at 9.30. And um, you could get your tickets up at the box office. Thank you very much.